I'm going to turn it over to Ashley, who has a, her presentation all ready to go. And um, so there you go. All right. Thank you, Shav. Thrilled to be to be giving you all this presentation, and I and I hope you all will indulge my excitement about what I learned in putting this presentation together. And I'm thrilled that our fellow member Clarissa is with us. She's traveling on her way to Wichita and connecting from a remote location. So I'm glad you can join Clarissa and everyone else. Thank you for being here. So let me tell you what I want to tell you about. Um, as a collector of Little Rock, Arkansas area postcards, <clears throat> excuse me, and also being a local, very small time dealer, small time dealer <laughs> for the past 10 years, I occasionally have come across kind of the same set of two or three or four postcards from a local park that has a historic attraction called the Old Mill, which is what you see on the screen now. It was built in 1933. So I would come across these cards and I knew a little bit about them, but um, it developed into to what I'm going to tell you about. So this is the truth postcards don't tell, little known facts from a 1933 Arkansas landmark. So these are the main postcards I'm going to reference in this presentation tonight. Um, from left to right, you saw first the Old Mill. The next in the middle there is called the Natural Beach Umbrella. Interesting. And the final one is called the Old Bridge. And the Old Bridge is in the same park that the mill is in. But the Natural Beach Umbrella is in a little bit different area. But it's very close by. These postcards all say Little Rock, Arkansas, like Lakewood, Little Rock, Arkansas, on the top right hand side of the description of them. And at the time they were printed, um, this part of North Little Rock where they are, and you see this on the map here, was actually part of Little Rock. It, Little, North Little Rock hadn't yet established itself as its own city. So the postcards reflected what was true at the time is that they were under Little Rock. But now and for a long time, they have existed in the town of North Little Rock officially. So there's that. Like many sister cities, you can see here on the map that Little Rock proper is, you know, just right across the river from what's now North Little Rock. This is the Arkansas River, how? It's not the Arkansas River. The Arkansas River runs through um, our town, right? So lots of cities, of course, grew up around river traffic and they have cities on sister cities on both sides. So that's the situation with Little Rock and North Little Rock. So I wanna take you with a closer, give you a closer look at each of these postcards that I showed you. And we'll, um, we'll say, the, like I said, the old mill and then that bridge called the old bridge, I showed you on the postcard, they're all within the same park that is officially named the T.R. Pew, P-U-G-H, Pew Memorial Park, but I just usually say it's the old mill park. And then this natural beach umbrella, as I said, is very nearby in, in a neighborhood park that's really designed for children. Um, has a lots of amenities for children called Lakewood Park. But both areas are in a planned neighborhood that you'll learn more about that's all called Lakewood. It was called the Lakewood Edition in North Little Rock, which began being developed in the 1920s. On the back of this postcard that you can see here and you can read it, the description is describing what we're seeing here. It's describing this umbrella. And the description is, in designing the structure on the reverse side of this card, the conception was as follows. A great cloud burst washed out a sturdy tree. Early settlers noticing it would make a great resting place and they made a straw roof, uh, a straw roof over part of the tree that left after the cloud burst. So anyway, what I've learned now is this was kind of the concept that the artist was trying to recreate that there had been a storm and knocked a tree over the, the early settlers wanted a place to take rest. So they made a thatched roof or straw roof over what was left of the tree. Anyway, but then somehow it has been referred to as a natural beach umbrella. Interesting. So anyway, that's, this is interesting. Um, this will make a little more sense later. But this, I want to show you this postcard first up close. Next is the old mill. And this is a view of the old mill and the park that surrounds it still today. The back of this card, as you can see, surprisingly, surprisingly has no information doesn't say anything. It just has the idea of, of what it is on the front. But you can see on the on this area here that it tells who had these postcards printed. Um, and so 
on all three of these cards that I've shown you, they were all commissioned and paid for by candy company in Little Rock that I had really never heard of and can't find much information on, but they were called the, the Kirchner Candy Company. And all of these cards were printed, they're linen postcards that were printed by um, the Kirk Tight Company, which of course was the, the granddaddy of all linen postcards. So now we have the old bridge. Again, there's no info on the back about this. It just says the old bridge, Lakewood. But on the front of the card, you can see in this bottom right-hand corner um, is a code. And all Kurt Tyke postcards have a code that, thankfully, we have a rubric that tells us what that means. And it's always referring to a date in the or a year, the first two characters and letters there. And so in this case, it starts with um, 8A. And many of you know that that means these cards were published in 1938. Um, and I'll show you information later about some other businesses that ordered cards besides the candy company um, of these scenes a little bit later on. But anyway, I wanted you to keep these three postcard images in mind as we go through. And um, next, I'll tell you why I decided to put together this program. So happy Clarissa is here because she was the inspiration for me to go down this rabbit hole you're going to go down with me tonight. Um, earlier this year, she gave a program to the Western New York Postcard Club, which she and I are both members of as well. She gave a fascinating program called Cement and Concrete on Postcards. Now, I'll admit, at first blush, that doesn't sound like that interesting of a program. Sorry, Clarissa, but it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Uh, so if you haven't seen it already, please go to the Wichita Club's YouTube channel where it's available for replay, and um, it's it's fascinating. So I encourage you to watch it. But Clarissa's program, this that I'm talking about, featured an unexpected quantity and variety of structures made with cement and concrete um, from her postcard collection of them. So it was fascinating. So when I was watching that program, I thought to myself, I wonder if there's anything I can add from my part of the country to add to Clarissa's concrete or cement postcard collection. So I was thinking about it and then it occurred to me, these old mill postcards that I've shown you. And I thought, well, that would be something that might be um, interesting for me to send to Clarissa. And I remembered that strange beach umbrella in particular. So there, that's why I went down this road and that's why we're doing this program tonight. Um, so I know you're thinking, okay, Ashley, why would you think of this beach umbrella in this view when you were listening to Clarissa's program? Well, the answer is the first truth that postcards don't tell that I'm gonna reveal in this program. You see this beach umbrella, parts of the old mill that I showed you, and then that bridge are all made of cement, okay? All made of cement. So I knew that whenever, Clarissa was doing her program and I thought, all right, this is something she probably doesn't have in her collection is some of this kind of thing. So that's the first, that's the first secret or the truth that the postcards don't tell. And we're going to learn a whole lot more about this um, in a minute, in, in a few minutes. So back in March on a Sunday, on a sunny Sunday afternoon, I decided it was my time to be a tourist in my own town and go just a few minutes across the river from where I live and go to where these structures are. Um, the beach umbrella intrigued me the most because unlike the mill and the park around it, I had never seen this beach umbrella with my own eyes. I just kept seeing these postcards and this is just frankly so weird. I just like, this is so weird. So I didn't know where to go really to find this under the general area, but my husband and I have a friend who lives in Lakewood. So I texted him that Sunday afternoon and I texted him a picture of this, this postcard and I said, does this thing still exist? And if so, where is it? And he said, I can almost see it from outside my front door of my house. And so he told me exactly where it was, confirmed it was still there and how to get to it. And so off I went. And I'm about to show you what it looks like today because this is from my visit. So here it is. This is the natural beach umbrella. And I've got two pictures here. You can see, you know, the, the bench part where you can sit on it. And then this, what looks like a thatched roof structure here. It's all cement. And I took a close up here where you can see the amazing detail that looks like, you know, petrified thatch on top. And of course it's been there since the thirties. So it's got some, some lichen and some moss growing on it. So this is what it looks like today. 
it's really strange, actually. Um, incredibly detailed, but it's not kind of architecture that I'm really used to see. Um, and maybe you aren't either. So it turns out this structure is more correctly called a palapa, P-A-L-A-P-A -A -A, roofed shelter. And I guess it probably does naturally occur in parts of the world where they can build these kind of things. But anyway, so the fact that they call it um, the natural beach umbrella is weird to me. But anyway, it's technically a Palapa roof shelter reconstruction or imitation. Um, and so this structure and many other structures at the nearby old mill and park are also made of cement. And they are all they were all made by a Mexican born sculptor named Di Dionico, no, that's not right. I was going to get it right. Diani, I'm going to get it. It's, it's D I O N I C O, Dionisio, Dionisio. I've got it. Dionisio Rodriguez. Rodriguez was a skilled practitioner of a technique with origins in Europe, but it's also found in Japan and in Mexico. And it's called Faux Bois, F A U X B O I S. Faux meaning artificial, bois meaning wood. And so it's French for imitation wood. The technique is also, excuse me, also referred to as trabajo rustico or rustic work. So that was, that was, it's just fascinating. So anyway, this is one view of the shelter, but I want to show you the underside of it. And look at the detail on the underside of the roof of the structure. I mean, it looks like mushroom gills, you know, it's amazing. And then look at the texture on the, the wood branches and then on the right you can see more of that and then you really can't see it very well here but all of these things are like little stepping stones and they have they're like cut pieces of cross cuts of of a tree and they look like that they have so much texture to them it's really really unbelievable um you can see the evidence of you know how he used textures and put texture into the cement to make it look real and you can also see and you saw probably saw in the prior picture <clears throat> excuse me how kind of whitewashed and not as colorful or not as stained looking these parts look because they've actually been exposed to the elements and the sun but this underside that's been protected from the elements really is brown like this and so it's evidence of the, the tints and the process he used to make things look realistic i'll tell you about in a minute it's just really fascinating so we'll learn more about Rodriguez in a minute, but first there's some history I need to tell you. Um, pictured here is a man named Justin Matthews. He was a native Arkansan. He moved from outside of Little Rock into Little Rock in 1901. He grew up in Arkansas, but he was from other part of the state. So he moved to Little Rock in 1901. He got married around that time. And he took a job for a company based in St. Louis to sell cotton oil mills. I guess to encourage people to get some land and then I guess this company would help them establish a cotton oil mill to get mill out of cotton, okay? Um, so he sold cotton oil mills all around Arkansas in a four state area. And he would entice people to build a mill by saying that he would invest his own 10% commission for the sale into that mill. So he would be a part owner of that mill. And so he did that and he, um, I'm looking at my notes here, in just a few years, the man had sold 88 mills in a four state area and invested his 10% in every one of them. At the time he'd sold in about four years, he'd sold 88 mills, as I said, he decided that he didn't want to do that anymore. He sold his stock in all those mills and you'll never guess how much money he made. The man made $1 million in money in like 1904 and actual like that was the value of money that day and that period of time was a million not today's dollars so he made quite a profit it was really smart of him to invest in those mills so he wanted to do something else it, this was in 1906 i just see my notes now that he sold all those and he was only in his late 20s which is about this time um well no this is later this picture i was going to say picture was in 26. So anyway, in about 1908, he had all this money in his pocket. He decided to invest in real estate and he acquired land on both sides of the Arkansas River. He realized the potential for residential growth in North Little Rock, okay, because it really wasn't residential or well, any like Little Rock was. 
so but the north side of the river was low lying it had swampy areas and when it rained it took a while for the water to run off of the dirt streets there was no drainage no sewer system no streets just a few streets were paved so it was not ideal for res residential development really even not good for automobile traffic so he decided he, that was the area he was going to focus on for development he spearheaded a plan <clears throat> to fund the paving of north little rock streets and the construction of a drainage and sewer system in 1913 1914. he also smartly served on the bridge commission and he constructed he was part of constructing two bridges across the arkansas river there was one already and there's a railroad bridge but as far as a traffic bridge there was just one but only could only accommodate one vehicle at a time so you had to wait you know for your turn to pass so he was instrumental in those bridges which of course would help people get over there easy to, to north of rock and back and so then in 1921 he got into his real estate phase and he platted the first sections of a neighborhood development called park hill and that was little rock's first planned <clears throat> subdivision so you can see the second arrow in this uh, view that's where Park Hill is on the map but the bigger section the shaded section of the bigger arrow shows the Lakewood land where he developed that neighborhood and you can see how close it was to his first development so Park Hill was successful he decided to to do Lakewood so by 1930 he had purchased the land on which he would later plat this next new Lakewood addition um, but the lot sales sales of lots to build homes on and home construction were delayed because of the Great Depression. So he was like, well, I don't, I'm sitting on this land, I've got to do something. What he decided to do, and he had plenty of money as we've established, is he established a company called the Lakewood Development Company. And they their whole purpose in 1931 was to start constructing six lakes in this area. That's why it's called Lakewood. He dammed up a stream, a creek, some naturally occurring water source that was in among the hills in the wooded area here and dammed it up to create six lakes. Um, and that, with that, Lakewood was born. And you can see here, the, the two biggest lakes are here. This is Lake Three and there's a few up here, but these are the, the main ones, but he, these are all man-created lakes. Makes for a very pretty neighborhood. So that was his first move. Well, what he did again was smart he took the most undesirable the most undesirable lot from his whole plan and he decided that he was going to do something else with it because it was unsuitable for home building it was swampy it was had it was drainage between two of the lakes so it wasn't right for home building you can see it here the arrow points to where it is so that's where he decided he was going to build this new structure called the old mill it's a new structure but from the get-go it was called the old mill um so you can see that here and then he's, he said so i'm gonna he said i'm gonna build an old mill and a park to surround it essentially to make a feature in this future neighborhood so now we're going to go to truth number two of this presentation so here are some modern photos these are the photos i took in march of the way the mill looks today and the park surrounding it. it was a beautiful spring day and then this is just the sign that's in the gate that that leads to it so the truth here though is this old mill is really a replica of a 19th century water power grist mill the old mill was really a new mill it was never an old mill to begin with and so the couple of truths in this part of the presentation is that the truth is he took a, a a detriment a lot that was never going to be able to do anything as far as home construction and turned it into a massive asset massive asset and so he um commissioned this to look like it was an, a 19th century mill and there's a lot more i'll tell you about that but uh i think he decided he was trying to create old pioneer arkansas feel like oh we built a park or, around this old mill that's been decommissioned and you know this is what it would be like if you were frolicking around the countryside around a mill that was out of commission but anyway so that was truth number two. It's really a replica. It never was an old mill. And um, I want to tell you more about it. This is a good view of the park that he planned. Here's the mill. And then he literally just kind of, this was a low-lying area. And this is the other lake. So this was, like I said, it was kind of a drainage area. And he 
captured water here for a pond, built the mill. These structures, this is another of Rodriguez's uh, many structures in this park. This is a, a bridge and like the handrails that are all, that all look like faux wood. This is that bridge that I showed you on the postcard. It's meant to, to look like a couple of trees fell over a stream and then had some interesting things growing out of it or hanging off of it. And then this structure here, you can see a little bit of, is another one of his cement structures that's called the Fallen Tree Bench. And it's meant to look like a tree fell over. There's a lot of poor trees falling over in storms in this whole, this whole world. So the tree fell over, you can still see its branches, but then there's a part of it that's a bench. And I'll, I'll show you a better picture of that later. So this is called the Fallen Tree Bench one. This is a little bridge. It's just, there's just all kinds of stuff that he built in this area. So here's some facts about it. The, the mill and park were dedicated in 1933. Um, it's very popular. It was a very popular, still is a very popular attraction. But when homes couldn't be built and lots couldn't be sold, this was here. And so people during the Great Depression in the area were really happy to have this beautiful park to go hang out in. And, and it helped them become familiar with the area. You know, Little Rock had, North Little Rock hadn't been very residential before. So it was brilliant that during the time when nothing could be done building wise, he created this pretty quickly. And it immediately became a very, very popular attraction. And when the economy improved, people started buying lots and construction began in 1947. So that, that gives you a view. This picture was taken in about the 40s of the park. And now um, there's gates and, and more of a structure around it. Used to, you could just drive up to it, but can't do that anymore, which is probably good. So I want to get back to these postcards because it was during this promotional period of time when the old mill and the park were built, but the land sales weren't happening, that Matthews created these postcards. You know, postcards were popular, popular thing to collect and send during that time. So it was really smart that he had these postcards made to show off what was in the area. And I guess he had this beach umbrella and that Lakewood Park built around the same time he did this old mill too, because that's what this is from. Um, but I want to show you some fun research I did that some of you may have done before. But I had a lot of fun doing, which is going to this wonderful archive of digitized records from the Kurt Tight Company, their production records. These are um, were donated by the Kurt Tight Company family whenever it was out of business, but they kept such good records. They had every production order that was ever done. I mean, we've heard presentations from other um, postcard club meetings of, about the kind of records they kept. Well, thankfully, you can get to these online, and I was able to search. I have it organized by state, so I went into the Arkansas files, and I found what I've got surrounded here by this blue box. I found this order that J. Matthews Company ordered for some Lakewood area postcards in 1933. But what's interesting is, you know, 1933 was the year the mill and the park were dedicated, but these cards are for something called the old stump. <laughs> everything is old in this world. If everything, the trees are bent over and there's trees that are stumps. It's crazy. So anyway, it's called the old stump. And then what this order says is called the Great Mill at Pew's Mill Park. But so, but um, they did, I'm sure they printed it with, it said the old mill on it, not the Great Mill, but the person who took the order called it this. So anyway, this is a very fascinating record to find. Happy to find it. I wish it told how many they ordered, you know, how many cards were ordered. That would give me an idea of how many there were, how many there might be. Um, so anyway, this is great. So I was happy to find this record showing that he, of course, was a man of promotion, obviously really smart businessman. He knew having postcards of his creations would be helpful. So here's some, re well, what you don't see, uh, let me apologize. I had another slide that I think I must have not um, put in here that shows another order that he did, um, that Matthews did around that time. But let me show you this. From 1938, here's a record of the postcards I showed you, the ones that I have in my collection that I've shown throughout this program that have this Kircher, Karcher Candy Company's name on the back. And so these are the, the numbers, the production numbers in the bottom right-hand corner I showed you that start with the 8A of the cards that I have that I showed you. So it was really cool to see this order um, that was placed with the company in 1938. So sorry for the mix up there. I've got another slide I can show you, but I can't do it right now that shows that other order. So that's super cool. Um, 
it's it's really a rabbit hole to go down and look through those production records. It's so much fun. So I'm going to get back to the cement, Clarissa, hang on, in a minute, that brought me to this whole program to begin with, but there's a couple of fun detours. This was one, looking at the production records, and there's one other connection I need to tell you about before I get back to Rodriguez. So this man, Frank Carmian, or Carmian, not sure how to pronounce it. In 1929, the Matthews Company, which of course focused on building houses and neighborhoods, sent this man, Frank Carmeen, who was designated as the firm's designing architect in this ad, you can see, sent him on a tour of cities in Texas and in California and the Southwest to observe um, new trends in residential architecture and styles that were popular in other parts of the country, you know, to inform how these residences that they were going to build, the styles of these homes they were going to build, what they could look like. So they put an ad in the paper and said, hey, we've sent our architects all around the country to bring back the latest styles for you and and to help with your new home construction you know so it was really interesting to see this ad and to see that they you know were thinking beyond the bounds of arkansas to, to bring some other parts of inspiration from around the country back to this home construction they did that important and this so you can see this 1929 ad from the arkansas gazette that that shows that when carmine visited when well let me back up so we're going to talk about rodriguez here when Carmian designed the old mill and park, he not only did houses, but he also designed the mill and the park. Um, the central element of that whole design, as I've shown you, are the designs by Dionisio Rodriguez. So he was hired in 1932 to come in and do these structures that I've shown you to make the park really special. So his work not only was shown in, like, like you can see in this picture, that's more of that, that bridge and that rail that goes up to the, to the old mill. He also, he also produced amazing structures inside this mill that I'll show you. So he was doing work outside and inside of the, of the mill. Space. So anyway, I just wanted to show you that. So this is a picture of Dionisio. Um, I have a few pictures of him. This is one more example, close-up examples of his work. Something else I want to show you, speaking of the mill, is here is the actual, another view of the mill from lower down. And you can see the water wheel. Again, this was not ever a working mill. It didn't have an actual water wheel in existence. And so this is a 10,000 pound cement, cement slash concrete mill, um, water wheel, and it works. I mean, it, it turns. And so I actually have a video that I took the day that I visited there to show this thing in action. And I hope, I tested this earlier. I hope you're at least gonna be able to see the video. It's not very long. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but I'm gonna try this and it's gonna switch over to YouTube and we'll see if we can see if we can see this here all right yeah i can't hear the sound either but you can see it right so it's great it, it works the water turns it water flowing over a little waterfall there and you're about to see that i have another postcard that i had with me that day And it's a whole nother postcard with a whole different look and feel that's made by the um, by the crop company, CR Care OPP company. But I wanted to take the postcard back to whence it came and to replicate the view on the postcard with what was there that day. So get back to this. So anyway, I wanted to show you all this view of the mill um, and the millstone that he made, 10,000 pounds, amazing. All right, so now inside the mill. Um, as I said, the, the, only the shell was really made. It was native, native rock made from, you know, Arkansas field stone. But then the inside needed structures. Everything you see here is made of cement. Incredible wood grain, cracks and details such as knot holes. And I've got this arrow here because this is what is shown here. It, with the light on it, you can just see I mean, it looks like real wood. It's unbelievable. It has cracks in it. It has, you know, the grain of the wood, wooden nail looking kind of peg structures here. It's all cement. This is, this is a structure that holds the, an actual millstone, but all this is made of cement too. That's in the middle of the mill. You'll see that a little better later. And just to think about y'all, this opened in 1933, this mill and park did. These cement boards and this whole structure has been here for a hundred years and there's no windows there's no glass this is really open to the elements at least to temperature and some rain 
it's incredible what what shape this is in. Here's a little bit more. This is a view of the staircase that is built because it's a two-story situation. So here's a staircase that goes up to a second level. It's all cement, same wood grain, everything. And then this is that millstone I mentioned that's on a platform down there to kind of show um, how the millstone would have turned and ground grain. So, and you can just see the wood grain here. It's really incredible. It's, it's just so incredible. And a massive undertaking, if you think about it, I mean, you had to fill this whole structure with structures that looked real. And it, I mean, even the ceiling beams, it's all cement through his process that he had. Really crazy. Um, so with that, I want to tell you more about Dionisio Rodriguez and his process. So he was born in 1891 in Mexico in a town called Toluca that was 40 miles southwest of Mexico. And at the age of 16, he moved to Mexico City where he learned a rust, the rustic technique that I've told you about um, of sculpture from an engineer and a contractor there who specialized in that kind of a kind of work. In the early 1920s, he moved to Monterey, Mexico. Then he moved to the United States. He first came to Laredo, Texas, and then he settled in San Antonio, Texas in 1924. Okay, and so there's the connection. If you remember when I was talking about the architect for Matthews, who had who was from San Antonio and then traveled in San Antonio and out through the Southwest into California, um, looking for those home styles. So I don't know if the contra or that that um, architect already knew of Rodriguez's work before being you know hired by Matthews or if when he was on that tour he came across his work. But nonetheless, there's no doubt that that's the connection as to how. Rodriguez wound up working at Little Rock. Okay. Um, so in general, Rodriguez did the um, most of his body of his work during the Great Depression. And that can be attributed to a lot of things, but one is that his materials he used were relatively inexpensive and available. He wasn't carving marble, you know, he was using cement. Also, important to know that in the early, early 20th century, when he came to the U.S., Rodriguez was not the only sculptor working in this medium and in this type of sculpture and type of art form, um, but his grasp of the technique and the detail that you've seen really set him apart from other artists of the period that were in that field. You can see here on the slide that um, he worked, did a lot of work during the Great Depression, but he actually continued to work until 1955, and he died in 55. Uh, from complications from a lifetime of long lifetime of undiagnosed diabetes. He did get diagnosed and treated for it later in his life, but it wreaked havoc on him. So there you see a picture of him in 1933, which was when he was doing the mill when the mill opened and all that work. So I want to tell you a little bit more about what else he did. Um, other works in the United States, he was commissioned for projects, as I said, from 1924 to 55. Most of his work was concentrated in Texas, specifically San Antonio. They have a lot of his work there. He worked in Arkansas, obviously, but not just in North Little Rock. He worked in other parts of the state, too. And then in Tennessee, specifically Memphis. And Memphis is just two hours drive now from Little Rock. I'm sure it took longer then, but it's not far at all. And he built a large collection of sculptures in a cemetery there called the Memorial Park Cemetery. And that is what, he's standing by one of those structures in this photo here, which I was great to see this photo. So he wound up doing a lot of cemetery work uh, throughout the United States. It's neat that I wanted to call out something. Let me just read from my script here. It said, um, several of Rodriguez's projects were monumental undertakings of a kind attempted by few of his peers. It wasn't just like a sculpture here and there. He took on massive, projects. The old mill was one of them, but he also worked in seven cemeteries across the United States. And I mentioned the one in Memphis, and that's where he is here. But there, I have a list of all of them, but for the benefit of our friend, friend Clarissa, the inspiration for this program, I wanted to tell her that there are two cemeteries in the Washington, D.C. area, which is near where she lives. There is a Lincoln Park Cemetery in Brentwood, Maryland, and Cedar Hill Cemetery in Suitland, Maryland, Maryland where he has sculptures too. So maybe you can go see him, Clarissa. Uh, so anyway, it was just fascinating. So he he had a little bit of a niche in creating really interesting experiences and structures in cemeteries 
and we're going to learn a little bit more about his um, process in a minute, but I want to tell you a little bit more about him. Y'all, his hourly wage that he was making for doing this work was anywhere from a dollar to $2.25 an hour. And by comparison, in 1940, average hourly wage was 50 cents an hour. I mean, so he was making really good money. Um, so much so that he bought a new car every year. <laughs> Um, and uh, we think that he did that, not we, they, they think he did that because he was traveling so much and driving so much around the United States. He didn't want to take a chance in having the car break down and he had the money to do it. But he apparently shared, literally shared the wealth with his family back home. And he hired some family members, like some nieces to come work with him. And I think his niece is one of the ladies in this picture. This picture was taken at the old mill, probably not long after it opened. You can see people behind him walking at the Part of that old bridge I was telling you about. So he's literally standing um, in that park with that old bridge behind him. So in front of them, would they would be looking at the old mill and then the bridge was kind of behind them. He married twice, divorced twice, had no children. His personality was described as very distant and serious and he was always dressed nicely, even dressed like this when the man was mixing cement and forming these structures. Of course, people dressed more the like that then but anyway it's amazing um and he never learned english despite working in the united states for 31 years learned that he uh would communicate in some kind of a sign language and i i suspect that some of these workers these helpers he had with him maybe they knew enough english to help translate but he never he never spoke english the whole time he was here um i want to show you a couple more of his structures um this is a, on the right is a closer up view of this broken tree or the fallen tree branch bench. I'm sorry, fallen tree bench. This is the bench portion. You can see there's a flat part here where you can um, sit. And then this is like the branches from the top of the tree that were kind of intertwined. And there's actually, it's like a bench structure in here too. You can go inside this thing and sit. In it. And then this, you can sit on this part here. And then on the left is another kind of a child focused structure, a climbing structure that's in that Lakewood Park that's nearby. And it's kind of hard to tell the scale of this, but you can see a child kind of sitting on the surround around this thing. It's good size. It's it's good size structure. Uh, so it's pretty neat. Um, I, but while you're looking at this, I want to tell you more about his process, about Rodriguez's process. Um, he was extremely secretive about his work, never using written plans. So there's no written plans existent that we can look at and refer to. He would mix the coloring and bonding agents and other products in the trunk of his car, y'all. He would mix it all in the trunk of his car, slamming the, the car trunk shut if anyone approached. And he also worked from inside a tent sometimes, like if it, in those bigger structures he was building, he could he'd need to have his materials closer to where he was working. So he'd like have a tent and he'd work inside and do all his mixing and then come out and, and you know, add the layers or whatever. Um, he would even remove the labels from and break the jars of all the ingredients he was using. Like he didn't even leave anything behind that would tell anybody what ingredients he was using. It's really amazing. And he was doing that to protect basically his intellectual property, right? And to keep people from copying his process and his work. So it's really fascinating. Um, as I said, sometimes he would hire people to help him, but he would never let them do the finishing process that he did to create the texture and to create the tents. Um, he just kind of teach them the structural, taught them the structural method and how to do that. And we know how that is done because there are still people, artisans in this general field and type of um, artwork today. It's just not as good as what his was. So in, um, these pictures here are, um, shows you a little bit of the inner workings of how how he structured his pieces because unfortunately some of them have kind of broken down um so here's a close-up on the here on this left hand side is a handrail from like another kind of bridge that's in that children's park and you can see the rebar here that he uses structure and then this is um i thought we might have seen a postcard order in when we were looking at those orders for something called the old rain barrel maybe that's the one I couldn't show you but this is all cement structure and this is all looking like drainage from the roof of an old rain barrel and this is by the old mill but I took a close-up here you can see a really thick piece of rebar that's exposed at the end because looks like some cement fell off I wanted you to see that so you could kind of see what was inside um, his process was when he constructed large pieces he would pour concrete footing 
Then he used steel reinforcing rods or rebar to create the different projections of whatever his structure was going to be. Um, and it notes say that in at least two occasions in the old mill in North Little Rock and at that Memorial Park in Memphis, he used copper rebar to ensure the longevity of the sculptures. Now that was not inexpensive materials. That was expensive materials, I'm sure. But so I want you to see these close-ups to kind of see how that worked. The rebar projections were then tied together with wire instead of being welded like people do with rebar now and probably then. So he tied them together with wire and then that form was wrapped with metal lath or metal mesh or screen material. And then that lath was filled with cement and sometimes rubble to kind of take up space for the larger pieces. And then after that, he would put a rough coat of cement to the exterior of the form to kind of build the first layer of the exterior of the form. So it's really quite a process to create structure for, for something that was like a wet, a wet cement uh, kind of structure. So then after that, when he got to that point, he would create and he would put a final coat of what is called neat or pure Portland cement. And it was added to the sculpture surface directly from the bag. And then he used homemade tools and kitchen implements to create the textures of the rock or the wood or the thatch or whatever he was doing. And then the final step was the application of color while the cement was still damp. And then he would hose the sculpture off with, wa with water. Rodriguez used a mixture of water and various chemicals to create his tints, his colors. Those chemicals that I guess somebody figured out that he was using were sulfuric acid, muriatic acid, iron oxide, saltpeter, and something called lamp black. And he used combinations of those to make the colors of these structures realistic. Now, you know, obviously time has taken its toll on those colors and you can see that these, you know, look kind of washed out. But as you remember, the underside of that umbrella structure still showed some good ground color. And even inside the mill, those, those boards, you know, that look like boards and handrails, they still have a lot of their tint as well because they, they've been protected a little more. Um, his tents and the way he finished these um, structures and sculptures was so realistic that in 1937, long after he had, not long, but after he had done all these, he was working elsewhere in the United States. But he came back through Little Rock because he had to repair some of his structures because they'd been damaged by people who were scratching the surfaces trying to determine if the pieces were real wood. So if that's not a testament to how, how good he was, um, I don't know what is. So uh, that was really interesting to read that. So even though his tints and his, you know, colors he put on these structures was realistic, they still weren't the colors that are shown on those postcards I showed you. I mean, think of the how like orangey and I don't know what color the, the umbrella was, but specifically that bridge, the colors on the postcard of that bridge. I mean, look at this. They were like, a, and this doesn't even show it quite as good as it looks in real life but it has like turquoise and orange and all this kind of stuff all across the bridge and so it was one of the other things that was puzzling to me when I kept seeing these postcards because I was like I've been to this park before years ago before I ever started getting into postcards and I and I was like I know I'd remember if this bridge was multicolored like this and so um I thought I would remember that so this brings us to truth number three for this presentation and that is colors can be deceiving we've learned this in other presentations that we learned particularly with linen postcards that the publishers and the designers really took their liberties with the colors they applied to these and it makes them interesting right um it the the deception worked but um in this case it was really quite the difference of how it looks in reality to how the postcard even then i'm sure they weren't this bridge wasn't that colorful when it was when it was first built. Um, and I'll tell you that this old bridge, it's, even though it's called the old bridge on the postcards, its actual name is the persimmon bridge. And um, like I said, it's supposed to be like two persimmon trees that grew together over a stream and formed this bridge. So that was the other, another truth for you. But now I've got a fourth one. So we're getting hot and heavy into the truths here, which is what inspired the title of my program. So for number four, the truth that postcards don't tell, another truth that postcards don't tell, this is something that I wonder if anybody knows what this is from. And I know you're on mute, you can't tell me. But what it is, is this is the old mill you can see in the background here. 
but it was in the opening credits of the Gone with the Wind movie. So there's my California connection for all you people close to Hollywood. So the it's really interesting how this happened. Now the old mill, or excuse me, the um, Gone with the Wind came out in like um, 38. It, it won an Academy Award in 39. And so um, it's not known how the movie's producer, whose name was David Selznick, how he knew about the old mill to even consider it for his opening scenes of the movie. The opening scenes of the movie behind the opening credits are just showing scenes around the South, like people picking cotton and other things. And then this comes by, you can see the old mill here in the movie. And so we don't know how he found out about it, but it certainly fit into this kind of opening scene he was trying to create about the old South. But um, I was thinking about how wonderful, I, I would love to know what Rodriguez thought about his mill that he helped build being in a movie because I mean this movie came out 38 and won the Academy Award 39 he was obviously still working and very aware of that I'm sure so that's really really cool the old mill was honored on the Gone with the Winds 50th anniversary and it's believed to be the only structure that was shown in the movie that still exists today so that's your that's your truth number four and I'm wrapping up this is my last slide I appreciate y'all hanging with me um, I'm showing here on the right a book that I ordered when I found out it existed that is a wonderful book that really talks about Dionisio Rodriguez's life and his works all across the country. It's a wonderful book, Capturing Nature, um, last name of the author is Light, and I just devoured it. This is my actual copy of the book, and you can see all the little sticky notes and my bookmarks and everything that I um marks so I could include it in the presentation I didn't include everything but I really encourage you if this is interesting to you at all to get that book it's fascinating but I wanted to leave you with her the author um, her last name is Light with some of her conclusions and her remarks about Dionisio's work Dionisio Rodriguez's work and his impact and this is a compilation of a few things that she said in her book Dionisio Rodriguez overcame illness and language barriers to build a successful career from a technique he learned in Mexico that had European origins. The art form he perfected endures in his existing works throughout the United States. For the most part, his pieces are in relatively good condition, I can attest to that, and remain as a legacy of this talented, unassuming artisan. Rodriguez's work did not afford him the same recognition achieved by other Mexican artists and creative individuals who became famous in the U.S. in the period of intense nationalism following the revolution in Mexico. That's why he and a lot of the people came to the States. So other artists that are of the same time period that are much more well-known in other mediums are Diego Rivera. We've heard of him. Jose Clemente, Rufino Tamayo, don't know about that person, and others. Uh, so she's just making the point that there were a lot of artisans that the United States had the benefit of that came from Mexico, but he really hasn't gotten the recognition that a lot of the other ones have. And she concludes by saying, although there are numerous craftsmen working in this Faubois or Trabajo Rustico art form today, Rodriguez's, Rodriguez's ability to recreate textures and patterns in nature has yet to be surpassed. So I will leave you with that. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. I, Thank you. That was just great. Thank you, I enjoyed putting it together. Well, I'm sure glad you did. That was that was really, really interesting and he, uh, he was uh, quite an artist. Um, open it up, you folks uh, have any questions, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. If I can. Ashley, it was a very interesting presentation, that's for sure. Yep. And, glad you uh, you know, uh, sorry? I'm glad you thought so. Go ahead. Yes. The only the only problem is that it's interesting that even the book is called a cement sculpture. They're not really cement. Cement is just a powder, so it's becoming cement is a base. He must have had some sand in it, so it's mortar or concrete. But cement is just a powder. It's look without the water is just a powder. Right. So it's interesting. Uh, that, right. It's interesting well, that they call it the cement sculpture. 
I would have called concrete or mortar sculpture or cement paste culture or something like that, but I'm too scientific maybe. Well, you're certainly a person to, to be able to split those hairs. And I wonder if maybe it gets the same because the outside, you know, described how you would pour powder and then water on the outside. Maybe it's because the outside layer is, I don't know. You're the, you're the person to know, but you're right. That is well, what they call it. It's, it's correct. But if you put the uh, cements um, and then he had to add the water. So then it's no longer, it's called a cement paste is, is making well, I mean, a slurry of cement. So, right. Yeah. I don't know. It's, yeah. uh, it's interesting that because uh, even the umbrella, if it was only cement is a powder. Good point. <laughs> so, it had to be a concrete. Yes. Sorry. No. Go ahead, Michael. I see you have a question. Yeah. I, I do. Uh, real quick for Ashley. Do you know if he was a Freemason? If Rodriguez was a Freemason? You know, um, I don't know that. And I have, the book didn't mention it or some, nor, nor any of the other biographies that I had um, read. So that's a really good question. Ashley? Yes. Um, there's one building that I can think of in California that um, it's not the whole building, but the Awani, which is the um, the national, it's a, a, a nice uh, hotel in the park, um, national park style in Yosemite, that it's made from granite, but it also has large, um, well, they look like big wood timbers but they're actually concrete because they wanted to uh, make the building as much as they could fire resistant. So they very much are in that faux bois style, but they're concrete. So I, I'm curious now to know, you know, exactly what technique they use to create those. And um, so uh, that's one that's one building that immediately came to my mind that you that used the faux bois. Wonderful it's a great building. I'm glad that came to mind. And I, I didn't read every page of that book I showed you. And it has a directory in the back of the locations of his stuff. So I'll look and see if that's in there. But other someone else could have done it, but maybe he did. Yeah, for maybe that. he was involved. <laughs> Thanks for yeah, it's a good good point that you brought that up. I forgot about that. That building is all made of all made of uh, cement or concrete, and uh, you would never know it looking at it. So yeah. that's 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 a great point. Any yeah. other questions? I this I have two comments. Yes, please. And the first one is my impression of the bridge when you first showed the postcard is it looked like an impressionist painting. Right, it does. And yeah. then the second comment is when you think about that concrete was first done by the Romans and how many centuries ago that was. And there you know, canals and all that, that they put in both in England and throughout the northern countries are still working. That's an excellent point. So excellent. you can't, yeah. um, it's been a hundred years and. <laughs> the only, the only difference is that the concrete we used by the Roman is totally different than the concrete we use today. And well, even the, the concrete that he used in his culture because the cement is totally different. Yeah. So, and also we only have the Roman structure that resisted. <laughs> the bad one are destroyed. <laughs> we don't have all of them. <laughs> well, the um, the architect Julia Morgan, uh, who is an has had a degree in engineering and also an architecture degree from um, uh, Paris, um, Beaux Arts School. She was an early. Um, she was one of the first to use concrete in in buildings, from what I can remember of her history. So, and she was that? also has anyone, any of you, meaning like even you East Coast people, been to? Um, um, why can't I think of the name, you guys? You have to help me out. Um, the state park at Asilomar. Um, because she basically designed and built it. It was originally a scout camp or a so Clarissa would know about that. Why why W Can you repeat the name? I didn't hear it. 
Julia Morgan at Asilomar. I think it was a YWCA. No, if, no. if you, it it's it was a um, campfire girl or one of those. It wasn't a Y. Mm. Um, she also um, uh, was the architect for a like a bell tower at Mills College in Oakland that I believe is concrete that I believe uh, withstood the um, earthquake. You got to get to bed. Yeah. You mean the one 20 years ago? No, earlier. Years ago? Wasn't she, wasn't she, she also? Wichita. Bye. Bye, Wichita. Thank you for joining. Yeah, see, see, you see, you tomorrow. Tomorrow. see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. I, I believe that she was also the, um, the architect that, uh, created Hearst Castle, wasn't she? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which was definitely. Yeah, the, the Mills College Bell Tower made uh, architect Julia Morgan world famous yeah. uh, for her use of reinforced concrete and uh, turned 115 in 2019. So, yeah, That's a little cool. older than that now. Yeah. No. So. That's great. That's great. Any other questions or comments, please feel free to ask. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, great job. Ashley, I just want to say thank you. It was really interesting. Very fascinating. And thank you, Joe. Two pieces are interesting connections. Um, one is uh, Disneyland uses a lot of that faux cement for almost everything that they're doing. Uh, if it's a structure, they make it look like wood or stone. But they also have that ride. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with Splash Mountain. It's like a mill. It's made out of that faux concrete cement or whatever. And it looks a little bit a lot like what he was doing, uh, Dionisio. And it just, even the briar pat patch that you go under in the ride and the way that he made that bench look, it looks similar. So I'm wondering if Walt Disney uh, knew anything about that um, or was inspired by that and then also there's a cemetery out here in california uh in the bay area that i've also uh, really been studying for years and they actually have some benches in there with that faux wood look uh, oh. and the benches and the the kind of pieces on the side of the bench are that faux wood so i want to check that out again now yeah but thank you thank you well you're welcome and that's interesting connections that you mentioned and um, like I said, he wasn't the only one doing this kind of work, but I guess nobody in the United States knew how to do that, that it came through these artisans that came through Mexico into the States. And aren't we lucky? <laughs> I mean, they had bad circumstances in their country, but it's lucky for us that they came and shared that, that artistry and yeah, it continues to be done. The, the Disney connection is interesting too, for sure. So thanks for bringing that up. And I just want to apologize. I was incorrect. Um, Asilomar was built as a, for the YWCA, not the Girl Scouts or the. Yeah, I just copied this off the history of Asilomar and put yeah. it in the chat. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Relevant though, related, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate y'all's attention to a very hyper-local, hyper-specific um, <laughs> topic that's close to me. So thank y'all for, for your attention. Well, Absolutely. we appreciate it, at least I do. And so, mm -hmm. very yeah, interesting. I appreciate it. It was very nice. Yeah. There's yeah. so much history everywhere. It's incredible. Yeah. It, it's uh, always interesting for me is that postcard can lead to to learn a lot of other topics. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of my most favorite things about postcards yeah. is that yeah. very thing. I just love. I feel like I've traveled around the United States and I haven't been to a lot of the places I'm looking at the postcards of. It's wonderful. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Absolutely right. That says it all. That's for sure.